Wonderful. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jenny Jackson. Welcome to our April Courageous Conversations event. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and our topic this month is uh, voting rights and the history of, of voting rights in America. Uh, I've introduced myself. I'm with Rogue Community College. I know many of the faces in our group here. I am adjunct faculty. Currently, I am live from Redwood Campus Wiseman Tutoring Center and uh, happy to welcome you all here. Uh, also working with my wonderful colleague, Sally Snyder, who is the coordinator of the Diversity Programming Board with Rogue Community College. And you get RCC's finest from the Courageous Conversations team this month, as our reverends are all busy this month. It was a busy month for reverends, um, but we can't help but mention their amazing contributions because they work on our planning team and are a great part of what we do. We have Reverend Ernestine Flemister from St. Luke's Episcopalian Church, Reverend Tom Berry with Bethany Presbyterian, and Reverend Ryan Scott with Newman United Methodist Church. So without much further ado, I'm gonna go through some of our basics and uh, I'm actually going to be your presenter today. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we get moving along. All right, the objectives of the, the Courageous Conversations project are to discuss systemic oppression, to create an awareness of our local history with racism and other forms of prejudice, to expand our circle of knowledge, to create community accountability, to network with people who are different than us, to share and spread new ideas, to generate a community of caring and mutual respect, and to give us courage. Our mission of Courageous Conversations is to enrich, support, and celebrate our diverse community by acting as a catalyst for inclusion, continuous learning, understanding, and acceptance through active engagement and facilitation of educational opportunities that challenge biases and deepen conversations. So our basic conversation ground rules, uh, we are here to create a safe space to learn, share and grow. So keep these ground rules in mind today as we share some of our own stories and answer questions. We ask you to have an open mind, open-mindedness, listen to all points of view and be curious. Acceptance, please suspend judgment as best you can. Respect, seek to understand rather than to persuade or convert. Discovery, question old assumptions and look for new insights. Brevity, go for honesty and depth, but don't go on and on. Sincerity, speak only for yourself and about what has personal meaning for you. All right, um, I'd also like to, to throw in on our ground rules that we would like uh, to invite you to please feel safe to ask anything that you like during these courageous conversations. If you do wish to remain anonymous, you can send the question via chat individually to any one of the hosts, which would be Sally or I, and we will respect your privacy and still share your voice. So on to our presentation today, uh, there's actually quite a bit of information that we have in this PowerPoint. And uh, our title today is Our History, Our Vote. And I would like to give a bit of a shout out to the League of Women Voters. You can see their logo is up there on our, our front page. They've actually done a lot of the work on this particular PowerPoint. And we had invited them to be our guest with us today and to present on this. However, no one was available to uh, be able to attend at this time uh, today. So they shared their info with me and uh, I will be sharing what I have updated and worked on um, with you today. Um, a little bit about the League of Women Voters. Uh, they are a local agency that works to get voting information out there to people. They, uh, the League of Women Voters promotes good government making the vote available to everyone and making democracy work. Uh, 
this is true of both the League of Women Voters and us as Courageous Conversations. We're not speaking for any party or particular philosophy other than transparency and including everybody. Um, they're volunteers. I, I, this work was done by a woman named Catherine. Her information will be here later. But uh, when she moved to the Valley in 1980 and joined the League of Women Voters, um, they were working to get a system of vote by mail. And there was a lot of opposition to that vote by mail at first, but the league kept plugging away. And finally in the year 2000, Oregon had its first presidential election entirely by mail. The turnout was 79%, uh, which is extremely good. Um, and the people who live here are, are pretty happy about it now. And you can thank the League of Women Voters for that. Uh, and one of the things that they like to do is to see an even higher turnout. National voting rates are about 55% at this time. Uh, so what we're going to do as we go through this, it, this is a little bit of a preview of what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about registering to vote, um, but I am familiar with our target audience here. Uh, so I'll probably move through that a little more quickly and spend a little bit more time focusing on the history of voting rights. Uh, in America. Uh, however, if you are in this meeting and you are interested in finding some help on how to register to vote or to check things online, we will be staying after the event to help anybody that might need that assistance. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to handle the ballot. Um, history piece is how did we get here. Uh, there are two Josephine County ballot measures on the ballot right now. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about that and just let you know where you can access that information. Talk a little bit about tracking your vote and then we'll have a question and answer and open conversation when we are done. So starting out quickly with the how to register piece, this is an actual screenshot of the Secretary of State uh, who is Shamaya Fagan and it is one of the ways that you can get registered to vote. Uh, so first, you can't vote if you aren't registered. Uh, you have to register so that the election office knows where to mail your ballot. Uh, nowadays, most people get registered when they get their driver's licenses. Uh, if you're not sure about whether or not you're registered, go online and search my vote, which I'll show you a little bit about that as we're moving forward. So this is my vote. I, like I say, it's that the, today is the deadline to register to vote, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, so if you haven't registered or double checked your registration, you do still have time to do that through today. You'll see that date there at the top. So the Oregon Secretary of State website comes up and you give them your name and date of birth and they tell you if you're registered and where they think that they should be sending your ballot, basically confirming your address. Um, if you do not have a driver's license, you cannot register online. Uh, in order to register, you need to be at least 16, an Oregon resident, and be a citizen. If you need to change your address or update your information, you can do that. Uh, a first-time voter in Oregon has to register by April 26th, which is today, not too late. All right. So uh, the DMV does have the signatures on file, but if you don't have an Oregon driver's license, you'll need to mail in registration or go to the election office. Since it's the last day, um, you'll wanna go into the election office today if that's something you need to do. So right here, we have a slide about updating voter registration online with my vote. Uh, that's just a place you can go to double check and make sure everything is up to date and current. Once again, I'll mention that if you do need any help with any of this, we will be staying after and our team can help you with that. You can update your voter registration online with my vote. How to handle the ballot. Let's put our unofficial ballot. I'm cruising through that because I think the majority of you are pretty familiar with that uh, process. This here is a page of Josephine County's website that has the link to the current voters pamphlet the May 17th, 2022, Josephine County primary election voters pamphlet. Uh, so you, you will also receive a voters pamphlet in the mail. Um, the one I'm showing you here is the online resource for Josephine County. Uh, Jackson County also sends them out. Uh, the Jackson County website is www.jacksoncountyor.org. So, 
what they provide is information about candidates and ballot measures in the pamphlet. Uh, once again, those are coming out to you along with ballots. Ballots begin being mailed out tomorrow on April 27th. So you'll wanna keep your eye on your mailbox for the pamphlet as well as your official ballots should be coming within um, the next few days. Uh, the statements that are put into the voters pamphlets are from the candidates themselves and they are not edited by the elections office. The candidates pay for these notices in the voters guide. So some candidates don't make the effort to be included. The ballot measures described in the voters pamphlet by law tells you who the sponsors are and who paid for the arguments in favor and against. The League of Women Voters also produces a nonpartisan voters guide, which asks pertinent questions of the candidates, rather than the candidate choosing what they want to say themselves. Uh, voters guides from the League will also be out within the next week. Uh, it does say it doesn't include local races, but this, this uh, slide here shows you how to access the vote 411 information provided by the League of Women Voters. Um, and it provides nonpartisan reports on candidates at vote 411. So they do recommend the League's vote 411 online voters guide. If you type in vote 411 and give your zip code, you will get a list of all the candidates on your individual ballots and all the information in the League of Women Voter paper voters guides and video links to interviews with candidates. All right, so once you've chosen all your candidates and said yes and no, yes or no on the ballot measures, you put the ballot in the secrecy envelope and then sign the outside of the ballot. Election day is coming up on May 17th, 2022. Uh, you can mail in your ballot. The postage is prepaid. Um, so any questions about that, like I say, we will be here to help with that after the event. All right, now we're getting into the good part. I love history. And so I'm pretty excited to be able to share with you a, a lot of the history that's been compiled, compiled by the League of Women Voters. So I really, this, this slide is left over from uh, 2020 because it was the 100 year anniversary of women finally got the right to vote was in 1920. So before you think it's really easy to do all of this, keep in mind that it wasn't always this easy to access our ability to vote. And it's not the same in the rest of our nation. Um, Oregon is arguably the easiest state in the union to get registered and get a ballot, but don't take it for granted. It was August 9th, 1920, when women finally got the vote. So the League of Voter Women Voters celebrated 100 years of having the right to vote in 2020, after 80 years of working to get that right. Um, this is an image of a new stamp that came out in 2020 to celebrate, reminding us that democracy is not a spectator sport. The price we pay to be free to express ourselves and to be treated as equals is to vote. Democrat, Republican, religious or not, all genders and all races. We have to remember that. Because it was in, in 1776, the only people allowed to vote were property owners, most of whom were older white men. There was really no such thing as the popular vote for president. Electors chose the president as they actually still do. Voters choose the elector through the electoral college, then electors vote for the president. The constitution mainly gave the decision-making of who could vote to each individual state. So there is a variety in the election laws in each state. At that time, most African-Americans had no property. So were never really considered to be voters. In 1790, the naturalization law passed. It explicitly states that only three white immigrants can become naturalized citizens. Two years later in 1792, 
people without property began to get voting rights in the states. In 1807 in New Jersey, where some women and African-Americans had been permitted to vote since 1776, New Jersey changed its laws to allow only tax paying white male citizens the right to vote. In 1828, religious restrictions were removed which allowed Jewish people to vote. A lot of dates and information here. Um, by 1848, the anti-slavery and women's rights activists united together. There was a women's rights convention held in Seneca Falls, New York, where newspaper editor and abolitionist Frederick Douglass gave a speech. The speech supported universal voting rights, which helped convince the convention to adopt a resolution calling for women's suffrage. In that same year, citizenship was granted, but voting rights were denied to Mexican Americans. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the Mexican American War and guaranteed US citizenship to Mexicans living in the territories seized by the US. However, English language requirements and violent intimidation limited the access to voting rights. By 1868, former slaves granted citizenship as US citizens with the 14th Amendment as voters, however, were still defined as male and voting regulation was still left in the hands of the states. 1870, the vote cannot be denied because of race explicitly. So other discriminatory, discriminatory tactics were used. The 15th Amendment passed, which states that the right to vote cannot be denied by the federal or state governments based on race. However, soon after, some states began to enact measures such as voting taxes and literacy tests that restrict the actual ability of African Americans to register to vote. Violence and once again, other intimidation tactics are also used. So 1876, the Supreme Court rules that Native Americans are not citizens as defined by the 14th Amendment and thus cannot vote. In 1872, women's rights activist Susan B. Anthony was arrested and brought to trial for attempting to vote in a presidential election. At the same time, Sojourner Truth, who was a formerly enslaved woman, appeared at a polling booth in Michigan demanding a ballot. She was turned away. But in 1890, Wyoming became the first state to allow voting for women. Yay, Wyoming. So discussing some of the other folks who have been limited historically in American history, um, the 1897 Chinese Exclusion Act prevented people of Chinese ancestry from becoming US citizens. Then in 1890, the Indian Naturalization Act granted citizenship only to Native Americans whose applications were approved as if they were the immigrants. Then in 1912 and 1913, women led voting rights marches through New York and Washington, DC. And by 1920, the 19th Amendment passed, which gave women the right to vote in both state and federal elections. Nineteen nineteen, after World War I, Native Americans who served in the military were granted U.S. citizenship. Five years later, the Indian Citizenship Act finally granted citizenship to Native Americans, but many states made laws and policies that prohibited them from voting. In 1947, Miguel Trujillo, a Native American and former Marine, sues New Mexico for not allowing him to vote. He won 
and New Mexico and Arizona were required to give the vote to all Native Americans. For Asian Americans in 1922, the Supreme Court ruled that people of Japanese heritage were ineligible to become naturalized citizens. In the next year, the court found that Asian Indians are also not eligible. Finally, after World War II, the McCarran-Walter Act grants all people of Asian ancestry the right to become citizens. Large scale efforts in the 1960s in the South to register African-Americans to vote intensified but state officials refused to allow them to register by using voting taxes, literacy tests, and once again, violent intimidation. Among the efforts launched is Freedom Summer, in which nearly a thousand civil rights workers of all races and backgrounds converge on the South to support voting rights. Then the 24th Amendment passed in 1964 which guaranteed the right to vote in federal elections would not be denied because of a failure to pay any tax. At last, the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965, which outlawed states from imposing discriminatory restrictions on who can vote and required the federal government to enforce the law. Subsequent laws passed in 1970, 1975, and 1982, which built stronger voting protections to allow Native Americans to vote without intimidation, literacy tests, poll taxes, and fraud. By 1971, the 26th Amendment was also passed, which granted voting rights to 18-year-olds. The Vietnam War was recruiting lots of people who were 18, and they could hardly justify sending soldiers to the war that were not old enough to vote. So who can still not vote? The Voting Rights Act continued in effect until 2013, when it was determined in Shelby Counter, County versus Holder that the portions of the act that forced some states to have monitoring of their voting practices expired. Several updates to the Voting Rights Act have been proposed but never passed. Felons who have not yet done their time cannot vote. People who may not have all the identification they need often find that they cannot vote. In our area, it is mainly people who do not get registered in time. So once again, today is the last day that you can register to vote. Um, people in Washington, D.C can now vote for the president, but they have no senators or representatives that they can vote for. And additionally, residents of US territories, including Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, and the US Virgin Islands, nearly 4.1 million people in total cannot vote in presidential elections and do not have voting representation in the US Congress. So that's a lot of history on um, what's happened in our nation. I know there was a lot of dates and um, names that can be a little overwhelming, but that is a brief history. Um, you'll see what we have up right now is our local ballot measures, which are currently uh, on the ballot this election for Josephine County. Um, you'll note that Jackson County currently has no current local ballot measures. Um, they do have a couple of races running. So right now for Josephine County, there are ballot measures 17-105 and 17-106. Uh, the 17, Josephine, 17-105 is a repeal of Josephine Ordinance 2021-002, which is really a land use, um, local land use laws. So that's something you can check on the, the pamphlet, the voters pamphlet will give you more information. Uh, so you can do some research on that. Uh, ballot measure 17106, I'll point out the, the clarity that this is an advisory question about Oregon, uh, many of the rural counties in Oregon becoming a part of Idaho. 
So that is really allowing the outcome of this election, the numbers that they receive is an advisory question that's not binding. It'll provide information to the board of county commissioners while the board formulates policy. We also have uh, the local uh, races. Um, the county clerk and county sheriff are on the ballot this time, but I read some of the fine print. Um, those will carry over into the November general election. Um, but however, the county commissioner position one and county legal counsel will be decided in this May 17th election. Which takes me to the track your vote slide. This is a place where if you want to check the status of your ballot after you have mailed it or dropped it in the ballot box, you go to the same site that we showed earlier where you registered, my vote, oregonvotes.gov forward slash my vote. If you don't see evidence of the ballot being received, you can contact, this is the Jackson County information, um, but you can also contact the Josephine County Elections Office. There will be a lag time between your ballot arriving and it being processed into the system. So keep that in mind. Uh, up next, I would really like to extend a heartfelt thank you from Courageous Conversations to Kathleen Donham and the League of Women Voters in the Rogue Valley for their work in creating this PowerPoint and the work that they do to keep people informed in the Rogue Valley and to empower voters. If you would like to reach out to Kathleen, her contact information is there and you could always reach out to Sally or myself um, if you would like to know a little bit more about that. So I've popped up some questions to ponder. Um, I've done a lot of talking, so we wanna hear you all do a little bit of talking if you have questions about some of those details. Uh, um, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Sally real quick to see okay. let's see what we Thank have. You, Jenny. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I've heard this presentation a lot of it before, and I still, um, I was like, oh, that's right, that's right, for you know, forgetting some of these things, and it kind of was amazing to me how it's not very long ago that people, a lot of people, were not represented with their own vote. Um, Pat Bath, I know, is actually a member and volunteer of the League of Women Voters. And Pat, I want to ask you, do you have anything that um, you want to share um, expanding on this presentation? I just remember going to a program, actually it was through our church, on becoming a citizen. And it's not as easy as it might appear. And so you might want to consider Courageous Conversations doing a program on that. Um, sharing some of the questions that are on the, on the test to become a citizen. And most of them are very basic, but there are some of them that, well, gee, I don't know the answer to that. Even when you've got a college education, there are some that are, some of the questions are not intuitive. So it just might be an idea for Courageous Conversations to, to do that. Very good program, Jenny, thanks. I really enjoyed oh, thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, and, uh, please go ahead. That's okay, I was just gonna say maybe we should, um, I could put the questions in the chat and maybe we'll stop sharing the screen and huh? wanted to ask folks, oops, I'm trying to multitask here. Um, if we want to do breakout rooms or if you like being in a big group um, with this. So I'm going to put these in the chat. So there's the questions. Um, so I'm going to just launch a very quick poll to see what you would like to do. If you could all quit, give a quick vote if you would like to uh, be in a breakout room and then we'll go from there. All right, we are keeping it, we're keeping it right here. So um, if you're comfortable turning on your camera, that would be great. If not, no worries. Um, go ahead and just unmute yourself if you would like to share something. Um, so the questions, what caught your attention from today's presentation? Is there anybody who found anything especially remarkable?
Denise, you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? No, I was unmuted because you told me to unmute. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't remember if I said un, un video. Okay. So, I, well, I did learn something, I, but I don't know if I could, I could um, recite it. But um, what stands out in my mind, of course, is um, when women were able to vote and then African-American women came later, right? So white women got the vote and then African-American came later. But I didn't realize that there were also these other, a lot of other um, populations that had to, that, that came along in, in their way as well. I didn't know that. So that was really interesting. Still being restricted. And, you know, keeping in mind that as women or as any group that didn't have the vote, you can't vote yourself in. You have to let the people who are in power give you the vote. Actually, Pat, there was something you had reminded me about, about women yeah, getting the, the vote. That women only got the vote by one person, one senator, I believe, in Tennessee, and he was still waffling. He couldn't decide whether to give women the right to vote. He figured he'd probably vote against it, but his mother either called or wrote a letter, and he, he read the letter or talked with her on the phone, and she said, you are voting for that, right? And it changed his mind. And that's how close women did not get the right to vote. I mean, it was, it's just amazing what a slim little one vote margin and who knows. Mm -hmm. Which kind of leads into the next question. Do you think your vote matters? Because I hear a lot of people think, <laughs> well, like if, if you, uh, for instance, have a partner you live with and one of you is voting one way and one of you voting the other way, does it matter? And I always say, yes, of course it does for many reasons, but also that there's more than one thing on the ballot. Um, and, and the more voice we have, I always think, I always encourage people to exercise their right. I'd chime in on that, Sal. Um, I, I've done a lot of research and, and um, I also learned new things from reading this PowerPoint. I would agree with what Denise said about, um, you know, we always think of like the biggies, um, you know, African-American rights and, and the women, but there were so many others in there, Native Americans and Asian Americans. And, um, you know, it, it just is overwhelming how, how much it's been fought to limit people's power uh, to have a voice. Uh, and a lot of that research, kind of long way to, to answering that question, is like there'll be elections like this one, like in Jackson County, there's not a whole lot going on in this election. Um, they're kind of small things and one person running for something. So there's not like an, a really difficult decisions to make. But I still find that I always vote in those elections anyways, because of the people that came before me to give me that right to vote. Like I get emotional about it sometimes, even when it's over something I might not feel really passionately about, but I do feel really passionate about that ability to be able to do that. And I exercise that right as a way to honor the people that, I mean, really put themselves on the line to give us that right. And thank you, Pat, for sharing that. I didn't know that detail about it really was that close down to, mm -hmm. to one person. So does anybody here have a concern about voting? What, um, either it's a personal concern or a concern about how our country's system works. And also remember if you would like to private message either Jenny or myself, if you don't want to say your, your question in front of everyone, we can say it for you anonymously, no problem. I'll, I'll pipe in. I. Um... I, I just want to um, <laughs> say, you know, thank you for doing this and for um, hosting this conversation. I think it's really important. And the history of um, women getting the right to vote is um, kind of something that I've looked into more recently and um, been kind of horrified at how much um, divide and conquer came um, between the uh, movement for women's votes and the women movement for black votes and um and how much it was it got diverted to a question of which should come first and you know which is our priority and i think that that um i i just i just want to raise that as part of that 
80 years of history leading up to um, leading up to the 19th Amendment. Um, and, uh, and I just want to um, put it out there. And just one other one other thing that I wanted to mention is that I um, just have a problem with women, not women, winner, is what I meant to say, winner take all elections. And so I think that um, that is a question that I'd like to raise here, have um, how, you know, how much has the League of Women Voters gotten interested in looking at alternative methods of running elections? And is there a, an opinion, an official opinion of the League of Women Voters about which is the best way to do elections. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, and since we have one member here, Pat, do you have an answer for that? Do you know? I know that the position. Did I did I unmute? You are unmuted. Yeah, yes. Uh, I know that we have talked about ranked choice voting and some other things in League of Women Voters. And it's a very good organization and they really keep you informed. They, uh, anyway, check on that. Is four yeah, and if, if you're not familiar four eleven is the is the is that the number to the um, a yes. website or something on voting? Yeah, it's like, the four it one one the, the uh, rank choice voting and if you're not familiar with ranked choice, basically you say, I would vote for this person as my first choice, but if they don't win, then I would vote for this person as my second choice. Um, because there's people who think, well, um, I, I really want this person to win, but I don't think they can get enough votes to win. So they actually vote for their least or their maybe second choice as opposed to their first. And so that way um, the winner takes all would be just the person who gets the majority, even though you might have, let's say two thirds of people who would have who would go this direction. Does that, is that a easy, does that make sense? Okay, thank you for nodding. <laughs> uh, I think a call, maybe call, uh, one or two states, I think may do that, maybe not for president, but for other elected offices. I'm not sure. It's, it's actually mathematically proven to um, make, make the most sense and make the, the, the most people happy, um, the, that ranked choice voting and there's a few communities, is what I understood. Uh, it's, it's probably uh, it's communities, you. not states. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So counties or cities right. having local elections, utilizing those methods, but um, it's a much better, better way. Makes it, a lot of it, sense. It might help us get away from just this only two parties in power, and um, it just expands so much, um, and helps protect voting. I think in so many ways, I don't know. So does anybody know how we could um, support that? What ways can we charge to make it become a reality? There aren't many people here today, but I mean, it, it would be a way to publicize ranked choice voting, courageous conversations. It's the first I've ever heard of it. I mean, so, you know, um, show up at city council, county commissioner meetings and suggest it. Um, I'm sure it'll go over really well. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, uh, we might have some in with the grants past mayor. I'm not, not positive, but we might, uh, we might sway them there. But I think that um, probably because our, our county clerk is a county position, we would need to convince the county to change. I, I don't know for sure. I'm not an expert, but... Um, well, it might take 15 years before we did that. And it's certainly nice that some states found out that vote by mail and is a good idea. You know, they, Absolutely. Uh, it's been clamped down on, but boy, a lot more people voted once they could vote by mail because of COVID. It's too bad that it was clamped down on afterwards. I mean, we've got the best thing in the world, you know, to for Oregon, but we're the only state I think that did anybody else go vote to go vote by mail nationally? Colorado thought of it, and Montana or somebody, but yeah, I don't think in the entirety like we have here in Oregon. I don't think so either. And again, yeah, and I, I, I 
2000. 2000. Yeah. And thanks and to I Lily remember Gubin, that, was in, that was one of the things I did not know that it was that recent because I moved here in 2000 and and that was the first so that was the first time I voted in oh they've got uh, mail but mail ballots right to your house how wonderful and two weeks to decide great I didn't know it didn't pass until 2000. Yeah I remember voting and pulling those I went to my old elementary school and you know if you went near the yeah. time I still have my I voted sticker. <laughs> and there is something special about that too, going in person and casting yeah. your ballot. But what I really like about getting it is it gives me a chance to really study um, the ballot. And there's some things that I know how I feel and I feel educated enough that I can make my own decision. But if there's something that I need more information on. I tend to um, go to sources of people who I, I value their opinion, I trust their research, and I, I say, what are you doing? And I start conversations about it to help me so I can make an informed choice. What else do you all do if you're not sure who to vote for? Do you have any um, suggestions of ways to find out more information? By the way, the library uh, speaker on representative democracy and censorship and so on the other day was very good. Nice. I missed the first one where Scott Stoddard spoke, but I enjoyed this one. I knew most of the information, but it was very well presented and interesting. I know that I really do rely pretty heavily on the voters pamphlet. Uh, you know, they send it out in person. I'll usually sit down with those together. And if I, sometimes it can be a little confusing and there's like all that extra kind of jargon in there and you kind of dig through it to get the information you're really seeking. And then I might do some additional kind of internet research. Um, but I really do heavily rely on that voters pamphlet. And um, I do find that for Josephine County, because that's where I'm, I'm based, um, I have pretty good luck at being able to access that information and the, the website is pretty thorough. And uh, I, feel, I feel good about the information that I can get online from, from that resource. And that's you know, totally um, the, the voters pamphlet, when you, when you run for office, you have to, um, to pay money to, to put yourself in there. And sometimes it's not, not cheap anywhere mm -hmm. from I think the cheapest they offer is hundred dollars for an opinion on um, on a on a ballot measure. You can um, put in a letter saying, "I think this is a terrible idea," blah blah blah, or whatever you want to say. And um, but um, and you have to you have to put in the statements really early. They they were due voter pamphlet statements were due end of February. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. If somebody didn't didn't get it together to um, be in the voters pamphlet, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not a good candidate. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of like uh, running running for office 101. Get your voters pamphlet statement, make it good, make it count, and get it in right. But um, still. You should maybe maybe don't always discount folks who don't have their statement in there. Good point. And also that, you know, just the equity of if somebody has the money to, um, even with their opinion, the mm -hmm. uh, arguments in favor, arguments in opposition, um, a lot of times it's the money that is, you'll, you'll see a lot of that voice um, when maybe the other voice needs to be heard. So, so yes, pay attention. Um, keep, keep your eyes wide open, your ears. Well, one of the last questions is how concerned are you about fraud? And, you know, that's been a real hot topic um, nationally. Um, a lot of, a lot of allegations, um, what, what have you. So do people here have concerns since we've been successful with mail-in ballots for over 20 years? Uh, what, what do you think is, um, is there a con to mail-in as opposed to being in person? 
Pat, were you going to say something? Even if somebody submits something to the voters pamphlet, League of Women Voters does not have the capability to check and make sure it's true and say, well, this isn't, I mean, they pay their money, they put it in there. Um, whether it's true or not is up to the voter to, to, you have to read who's sponsoring it, who, who supports it. You, you look down and see, oh, you know, to find out because mm -hmm. League of Women Voters does what they can, but they're not, they can't censor everything. I don't know if they can, it's what people put pay to put in there. That was even shown in the, the notes on the PowerPoint from, from the compilation of the history where it was like, yeah, even though it is in the pamphlet, it's by law, it has to state where that information is coming from. Oh, I thought it was something with candidates. Um, when I listen to candidates, I listen for what is their plan? Um, a lot of people say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But how are you going to do it? Anybody can say they can do whatever they want. So really pay attention to how do you plan on doing this? And if you, if you are able to talk to them, if it's a local person, um, get some specifics, um, get some ideas going there. And that's it, that's all I was gonna say. It looks like I was gonna say more, but no. Has the League of Women Voters been involved in monitoring um, elections, um, gone and, and watched the counting of the votes or any of that? I don't know. I think of it as being precinct workers that are in the office. I'm not sure whether they, I mean, I've done it. I've been a precinct worker and, and stayed while the votes were counted some of the time. Anybody can can. I think you do you have to be you have to be a precinct worker uh, captain to do that I can't remember, um, but but is it anybody can sit and watch them count the votes? Pretty much there uh, you have limited, so you, it, it kind of depends on the uh, the county clerk. You have to register with the county clerk, but then you can go in there and watch. Yeah, because it's an interesting so. thing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was the question? Certainly interesting in the society and the other states and so on that they're making it totally partisan so that one party would not be able to have anybody of the other party helping out in the elections or being in the room when the votes were counted. Yeah, that feels weird. Yeah. Um, I, I did, you know, we, we talked about our own system of vote by mail. I think one of the the unique experiences for us in Oregon was kind of the national snafu about voting by mail and how much kind of people were throwing around how fraudulent it could be. And we're like 20 years ago, we kind of um, figured this out. And, and I didn't realize that it was such a centralized thing in Oregon. Um, and, and I've also had some of those, those concerns before, but I have um, just personal, speaking from personal experience, I have like kind of sloppily signed the back of my envelope and sent it in. Um, and my husband has done the same thing. And we have both been called by the, the voting office and like, hey, this doesn't really look like your signature was this you. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. my bad. I was a little sloppy. And mm -hmm. I was really shocked to see that they double checked on both of ours and they actually required, and this was in two different elections, they required us to come in and sign a new voting card with a more kind of proper signature. So I'm a little more cautious when I sign it now, um, which I thought spoke pretty highly to, um, to our, our folks that are working in that office because you know they see a lot of ballots and that they're really double checking and making sure that the process is, is proper. I thought that was a, a good thing to share because I've had that experience myself, which was cool. Yeah, I trust our system in, in Oregon. That's nice. That's really nice to be able to see you say that and, and believe in that. That's a, that's I, a hope good feeling. I hope it's the same in all the other counties, but. Yeah, right? I trust our system in Oregon too. The, the one concern I um, still have about vote by mail and there's no perfect system, right? So it's um, just having a concern doesn't mean it's the wrong way to do it, but it is, um, it is uh, people who are in 
unhealthy relationships and being pressured to vote a certain way, then, then it's really you, you're signing it, but you're voting a certain way to avoid a fight at home rather than because it's what's in your heart. And so the, the sanctity and the privacy of the voting booth is something that was um, given up in order to have the um, higher voter participation, which I think outweighs it. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge what was given up. That's a really valid point, Dorothy, thank you. Something to think about. I, I actually took quite a bit of notes and learned, um, learned all sorts of new things. I thought I was, I thought I knew I, more than I thought. It's, it's good to learn. So I'm going to pop my share screen back up and skip on to our next slide. Um, which is our next Courageous Conversations event that will be coming up next uh, next month on May 24th. We will be having uh, Taylor back as our guest uh, to continue our conversation about Sunrise Communities. So we do hope that you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, once again, Sally and I will be hanging out a little bit afterwards. Um, if anybody has any more questions or concerns, or would like to know anything about um, registering to vote, especially since today is our deadline to get registered to vote. And thanks everyone for joining us today. It's always good to see you.